2011 to 2015, mainly teaching US-Japan relations and EAP classes. Uh, and actually, it was during that time I would get a lot of uh, former, in particular, former US Navy or former US Marines students who come here to Lakeland. And through them, I learned about uh, the bases offering cultural training programs for newcomers. Uh, what's your <laughs> orientation programs for newcomers uh, arriving at military bases in Japan. And that got me interested in thinking about uh, just cultural exchange and relationships between military bases and the surrounding communities. Uh, so of course, most of the bases or half the bases are in Okinawa. And so a lot of my research is based there. And I just come back from Okinawa. So I'm gonna start by talking about that. So I'm gonna talk about it today. Um, I chose, well, Okinawa, as most of you probably know, uh, is famous for having a very fraught relationship with the bases, right? Um, very often when you think of Okinawa, especially if you're thinking about politics, the first thing that comes to mind might be bases and protests. Japan took in like 2,000 in Tokyo. That's a, that's like nothing. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, so, just for a quick overview, uh, there are about a hundred thousand Americans in Japan at any given time under the uh, U.S. Japan Alliance and Status of Forces. Half of those are troops. The other half are. Uh, civilians like contractors, they are the dependents, like spouses or kids of the troops, or they are um, other Americans affiliated, affiliated with the bases in different ways. Um, half of them are in Okinawa. Uh, if you look at the population of Okinawa, it is a little under 1.5 million. This means that about one in every 30 people in Okinawa is there with the U.S. military. That's pretty remarkable, I think. When we think about the scale of 100,000 Americans compared to the you know, uh, tens or hundreds of millions of people in all of Japan, half of them in Okinawa, where the population is so small, means that they, they absolutely stand out. They take up more space. Um, of course, they take up lots of physical space, too. 70% uh, of the land used by U.S. military facilities in Japan is Okinawan land. You can see on the map here, all these orange and blue and green and pink areas are all uh, land. You can see places like Kadena Town is more base than town. Um, so to get into this, I want to start with a little bit of the history. Uh, of course, uh, at the end of the world. So when America entered the Pacific War, World War II against Japan, the only place where Americans and Japanese fought on land in Japan was Okinawa. Uh, Okinawa was chosen by the Japanese leadership to be kind of this place where they would hold off the Americans for as long as possible so that the other islands could build up their defenses. Uh, and many people have pointed to this as a kind of sacrificial move, as a kind of uh, giving up on Okinawa in hopes of protecting what they saw as the heart of Japan or the true Japan. Um, but this was, in fact, the bloodiest battle in all of World War II. It went on for 82 days. It started with what's called the Typhoon of Steel, this massive, massive shelling of Okinawa from US ships. Um, and there were, uh, all kinds of terrible stories that came out of this, of uh, Japanese soldiers and leaders uh, pushing Okinawans to kill themselves or kill their families or kill each other in order to keep them from falling into enemy hands. Uh, also things like Americans using flamethrowers. Uh, it was a very horrible time for all. Um, and uh, so we can't talk about Okinawa today without talking about this history and what came out of it because uh, Okinawans, as you may know, have the longest life expectancy in the world. 
So there are a lot of people there who remember. Uh, and for those that don't, it is very much a part of education in Latino America. It is something that everyone grows up learning and hearing about because they really want their education to be focused on peace. So they want to keep the memory of war alive. Um, so the US lands in 1945, the war ends and the troops stay, right? Uh, the official occupation of Japan as we know it was seven years, it ended in 1952. But at that time, uh, the US and the allies decided that Okinawa was not Japan. They decided it was something separate called the Yukis, and that therefore it would be under US administration. So uh, the occupation of the Yukis went on for an additional 20 years, um, meaning that the experience of being in Japan from 1950 to 1970 and the experience of being in Okinawa are vastly different. And also meaning that uh, having so many Americans in close proximity is something that Okinawans have experienced for a lot longer. Um, the occupation period is troubling in a lot of ways. Uh, first of all, Okinawans didn't belong to a country, so they didn't have a passport. They had to get special permission from the US government to travel, but they weren't US citizens. They weren't technically citizens of any country. Um, and the US military had a lot of power over them. Um, you had, on the one hand, uh, the US taking free reign in terms of building military facilities, building the roads that would be useful to them. But on the other hand, not investing in non-military infrastructure. So you have these great roads for connecting the bases, but no train system. And during this time, of course, Japan is experiencing, is experiencing phenomenal growth and is building this amazing uh, social security system that many of us benefit from all the time. But that didn't exist in Okinawa during this time. There was no national health insurance. Uh, there was no health insurance, in fact. So a lot of the developments that happened in Japan came much later to Okinawa. Uh, meanwhile, uh, in the beginning, the military was where all the money was. It was the biggest source of employment. It was the best place to work. So a lot of people's jobs or livelihoods were dependent on the military. Uh, but the military wasn't exactly fair. Uh, in addition to things like huge differences in wages between American and Okinawan workers in the same jobs, it even went so far as things like differences in the punishment of crimes, depending on whether it was committed by or against an American or by or against an Okinawan. Um, I put up one of the examples here, this what's called the A sign. Uh, this was something in order for a restaurant to serve military personnel, a military inspector had to go in and say that it was safe and clean. And then if it was safe and clean, they got this A sign saying it was hygienic and they display the A sign and then American troops could eat there. So if a cafe was known for hosting activist groups who were planning a protest against the bases, the inspector might come by and take away the ACE. And then suddenly they would lose all of this income. It was a way to hold power over places, over people's livelihoods. Uh, so uh, a lot of uh, unfair practices went on during this time. And there were a fair number of protests. The picture on the left here, on your, sorry, on your right here, uh, this is June 5th, 1969. It is a, a labor strike. It is uh, workers uh, protesting at Kadena Air Base, trying to get better working conditions, and Air Force uh, troops pointing bayonets at them. So this was this is not a peaceful uh, conflagration. Uh, so these are the conditions under which Okinawa eventually returned to Japan uh, in 1972. Uh, part of this return process was about Okinawans believing that, not all Okinawans, but many Okinawans felt that if they return to Japan, Japan has this amazing peace constitution, has Article 9, which says no war, no military. So people believed if we rejoin Japan, then we can get these American bases out because we'll be under this peace constitution. However, unknown to most Okinawans, the Japanese national government and the US government got together and decided that they would allow Okinawa to rejoin Japan uh, 
only so long as the US military bases got to stay in Okinawa. So this was a disappointment for some people. Many of them were very excited. At least now they could be part of Japan's economic miracle. They could get, they could uh, reclaim sense of Japanese identity. Uh, so it wasn't necessarily a terrible change, but there were people who were disappointed at this lack of change in the status of the bases. Um, but what's interesting to me about this change is uh, one of the direct results is that uh, Okinawans were no longer able to take their complaints, their issues directly to the base. Uh, when the U.S. was administering Okinawa as the VPs, the Okinawan people could go to the U.S. administration and say, this construction is dangerous, this base is too loud, these crimes are happening. Now, they go to the Okinawan Bureau of Defense, which goes to the Ministry of Defense, the national government. And only the national government has the power to then go to the U.S. government and the U.S. military and request changes. And all of these steps mean that often these concerns are lost along the way because there's no direct route of communication. Uh, if uh, an Okinawan working on a base has a problem, they think they have an unfair labor issue, they can go to their labor union and then their labor union again goes through all of these organizations connected to the Ministry of Defense, even though their workplace is the base and the, their direct supervisor is most likely an American at the base. So this move actually creates kind of a buffer for the Americans to keep a lot of these, to keep from having to deal with a lot of these complaints directly. Uh, and it also means that if the Japanese government decides, okay, yes, it is too loud, you all deserve to have double-paned windows to keep the jet noise out or soundproof walls, it's the Japanese government that pays for it. It's not the US. So, uh, this is, it creates a very interesting uh, idea of where the burden is. On the one hand, uh, the U.S. has given up all of its, the burden of having to worry about or care for the Okinawan people. They've shifted that to the Japanese government. But the Japanese government can still put all of these bases, this huge concentration of soldiers, onto the Okinawan people. So uh, let's talk just a little bit about what it means to be near a base. This is uh, Marine Corps Air Station Kitenma uh, in Okinawa. It has been called the most dangerous military base in the world. Uh, you can see around this airstrip where uh, military aircraft take off and land every day, there are extremely densely packed uh, residential areas. There are schools and hospitals and daycare centers and neighborhoods on all sides of this base. So that means that noise from the base, spills from the base, crashes from the base, accidents from the base, anything has a huge risk of affecting the surrounding community. Um, and this has always been an issue. People built up around the base in part because in the beginning, that's where the jobs were. But this huge density around the base means that it's ripe for accidents. Uh, there are some very famous accidents that have resulted from the U.S. military in Okinawa, uh, starting with the 1959 crash of a U.S. aircraft into an elementary school. Uh, about 18 people died, 11 of them children, and about over 250 others were injured. Uh, so these are all things that are informing Okinawan's past, their history, as they look at the bases in the present. Uh, in 1995, there was a very famous case of a very young girl who was abducted by several Marines and a sailor and gang raped and then basically left in a ditch. And then initially it looked like the culprits would not be tried by the Japanese system. And so there was a huge amount of outrage in Okinawa that these guys were just going to get away with it. And also that this couldn't have been prevented, that, that these kinds of things should not be happening. Uh, so there was a huge explosion of anti-base sentiment that came out of 1995. Uh, and we'll come back to what that meant for Katema in a minute. But a couple other quick things to mention. Uh, there have been many other, you know, murders and sexual assaults over the years. Um, 
There's also the case in 2004, a military helicopter crashed into Okinawa International University. Fortunately, it hit a building that was not occupied at the time and no one was hurt, uh, but it really goes to show the dangers of having these airfields so close to an urban area. Uh, and then uh, in 2018, a journalist in Okinawa released US documentation, or US documents showing huge amounts of uh, chemical and fuel spill that had been hushed, that had happened across Okinawa coming out of the bases, potentially affecting Okinawan ground. So these are all uh, issues that people have to deal with. In addition to just constant aircraft noise, uh, in incredibly dense traffic, and the traffic isn't necessarily because there are so many troops, it's because the bases are so big and take up such huge tracts of land that it's very difficult to build roads or trains across the islands. And most of the time you have to drive around the, at the coast on the outside to get anywhere. So there's all of these uh, factors that lead into making living around the, the bases difficult. So in 1996, uh, after the uh, after this famous rape case in 1995, uh, the U.S. military and the Japanese government said we're going to move to Tenen. Uh, and what they decided on was that they would move it. They would expand Camp Schwa in uh, Tenenbaum. Is my Zoom control bar showing on the screen the whole time? <laughs> it, it's showing here, but not not at home. Okay. <laughs> Um, so this was decided in 1996. Uh, if you watch the news about Japan at all, you know it didn't even really start construction until 2018, and it still looks like this. This is because Okinawan people, Okinawan politicians, uh, over the decades have put up all different manner of resistance against this construction. Um, so this is seen now as kind of the central issue. If you're talking about base politics in Okinawa, this is the thing that people really focus on, is the construction of this base. Um, it's something that's called the new base, sometimes it's considered an extension of Camp Schwab. But the idea is to expand out over the sea and then move Tenma Air Base, all of their facilities and all of their functions to this site because it's very rural, it's coastal, it's far from any major city. So the idea is it isolates the possibilities of crashes and leaks from affecting people. Uh, so you can see that they're trying to address this idea of Tenma being a dangerous place that needs to be moved. Uh, however, Okinawans have been very, the vast majority of Okinawans have been very against this plan because uh, first of all, they didn't want the base moved. They wanted the base read. Uh, they wanted that base, and some of them want all bases gone. Uh, they don't want new construction, new bases being built, new people being brought. Um, in addition to that, uh, the environmental costs of this construction are huge. As you can see, they're doing landfill out on the ocean. Uh, they discovered midway into the process what experts had been telling them all along, which is that the seabed there is like mayonnaise. And so it's very hard to support construction. We need to put a lot of extra support in. So there's just a huge amount of construction that goes into tearing up and building on this place. Uh, it is a coral reef that is going to be destroyed. It is uh, a habitat for the dugong, which is it's something like a manatee. It's an aquatic mammal that it has very special cultural meaning to Okinawan people and is endangered. And this is in fact considered one of their last habitats. So there's concern about the uh, destruction of the dugong. Uh, also, there are rules in Okinawa about what can be done with the soil, in part because so many Okinawans died in the war and there were there was just death everywhere. So there's an idea of a lot of people's remains still being in the soil. So there have been protests about using Okinawan dirt for the landfill to fill this up in order to build it, uh, which has meant that Dirt has had to be shipped in from other parts of Japan and other countries, which adds to the expense, it adds to the time. And there are campaigns in Okinawa where they're contacting mayors of other cities and saying, please don't sell your dirt to us because it goes against what we want. So there's all these different layers 
to what's going on with this issue. Um, and it gets a lot of media coverage, right? If, the, if Okinawa is on the news, uh, usually it's because uh, there was a major crime, most often committed by an American, or because of something to do with this concern. So building on all of this, the, the history of war and of post-war abuses, the uh, presence of these loud, dirty bases causing problems, this history of crimes. Um, a lot of people have this idea that Okinawans hate the US military. Uh, and in fact, uh, a lot of people I've met in the military, especially people who haven't been to Okinawa, are convinced that it's a terrible place to go or that people will hate them or that it'll be difficult to go outside of the bases because they'll be faced with constant protests or people will give them dirty looks wherever they go. Um, so of course there is a, a history behind animosity towards America. And if you compare Okinawa to other parts of Japan, the protests are much bigger and much more visible. So it makes sense why people think this way. Um, but I want to talk about this as just one image of several images that we can look at of Okinawa that all kind of obscure what's really going on, at least in what I've found with my research working with Okinawan people. Uh, so I've had I've had many conversations with US military personnel about Okinawa. Uh, I hear a lot of things like uh, they are being manipulated by a leftist media. They're not sophisticated enough to understand international relations, and so they don't understand why the bases are necessary. Uh, or more sinister things, like uh, many people have told me that, uh, to give an exact quote from one uh, Marine lieutenant I spoke with, Okinawans are only Japanese when they want money from the government. Uh, this idea that if they protest enough, the government will pour money into Okinawan projects and so if they keep protesting, they'll keep getting money. Uh, I've met many people, including some uh, people here in Tokyo, some Japanese people, who are convinced that this is what's really going on behind the protests. Um, I've also heard uh, military, uh, I've, I spoke with a, with a Marine in Okinawa who described Okinawans as adversaries. This was in the context of talking about volunteer work that the Marines did as a tactical strategy to control the narrative and keep it out of the hands of the adversaries who wanted to make them look bad. So I don't want to say that this is everyone in the military. It definitely is not. But there are definitely stories moving around inside the US military about Okinawa being a place where Americans are hated, where Americans are unwelcome. Um, Speaking with some Okinawans about this, uh, I did get some interesting ideas about whether or not they're actually scared of the Americans in Okinawa. Uh, many of them told me about places that they don't go. They're like, oh, we don't go to this part of the town where all the bars are at night because that's where all of the drunk troops will be. Uh, or there's an idea actually that there are bad bases, that the farther north you go, the worse the troops get. And so like, the northernmost bases, uh, Hanson and Schwab, are like timeout corners for the bad troops. Um, I won't comment on whether or not that's true, but I'm getting some nods from the audience. <laughs> um, so there's a sense from people in southern Okinawa that you don't want to go up near the bases in the north, but the bases in the south are maybe OK. Um, I also I met with an Okinawan woman who uh, actually met her at a base function. She uh, joins uh, an English class that's offered by one of the bases, uh, taught by volunteer troops. Uh, and I asked her why she joined. And she said, well, you know, when I was little, I was really afraid of the men. They were so scary. When they'd come into my work, I would hide behind the counter and hope that they would go away. Uh, but I wanted to get over that. So I decided to start taking these English classes and getting to know them. And now when I see them at the supermarket, I can wave and say hi. She told me the story that's like really nice, right? About like getting over fears and getting to meet new people. And then she said, of course, it was really scary that time when the drunk soldier came into my apartment at 1130 at night. My children had just gone to bed. I hadn't locked the door. I lived on the third floor of an apartment building. I don't know how he came to my place. 
so that he just stood in my living room with his shoes on, babbling incoherently until I finally remembered the word police and I kept repeating the word police until he left. And from that day forward, I've always lost my way. She told me that story and then she said that she talked to her neighbors and found that it was actually a reasonably common experience, that it was well known in the neighborhood where she lived, oh, you should definitely lock your doors. She found uh, an elderly woman living alone who had experienced this too. So uh, she had this very interesting idea of she wants to get to know people. She thinks that they're friendly. She wants to be, get over these fears, but at the same time, she has experienced what she sees as, as a real danger in their presence. Um, and then one last thing I want to add about this. Uh, I was on a walk one day in Chatham, in central Okinawa, where many of the Americans live, where some of the largest bases are. And I was walking with uh, a representative of the US military and a representative of the US government. And we were all walking together and they were talking about all of the projects that the bases go through to be good neighbors to Okinawan communities. And then the conversation shifted. And one of them, as we got towards his neighborhood, said, Yeah, one of my American neighbors poisoned my other American neighbor's dog. While I was on vacation, one of the kids next door tried to break into my apartment. And the other one said, That's why I won't live in the American areas. That's where all the crime is. So I thought this was very interesting that the Americans, in some cases, are scared of the Americans. So this is this is one image is this idea of the uh, Bay of Okinawans as hating the Americans in the Bay Uh There's also the opposite image, especially if you talk to uh, Okinawans who work on the bases or the a lot of the people who volunteer, like uh, troops stationed at the bases who volunteer in the communities. A lot of people will tell you that oh, actually people love us. Uh, we're very much welcomed here. People are really kind. They're always helpful. Um, if you ask, they'll tell you that every year when they have an open base festival, thousands and thousands of people will come. And this is true. These are all true. This, I took this picture about two weeks ago. This is a Halloween event on a military base. Uh, so these are very small trick-or-treaters getting a pack of Skittles from a robot designed to disarm bombs. I thought it was kind of cool. Um, uh, so... Uh, there's also this sense of they are welcome, that people like them. And of course, uh, people love the uh, idea of having English speakers around. It's an opportunity for many people to learn English. Uh, you have the introduction of American culture. Uh, this particular base has been having local children dress up for Halloween for 15 years. And I don't think people in Tokyo have been dressing up, not on the scale that they do now. So, there's American culture coming in. Of course, there's American fast food everywhere. The very famous Okinawan food is taco rice based on Americans wanting tacos and taco shells being hard to get. Um, uh, you'll see lots more people in Okinawa with tattoos than people in the rest of Japan. And that has to do with the prevalence of tattoo parlors to serve the military and then working with the local population. Um, the uh, US military radio station uh, AFN is the only radio station that reaches every corner of the main island of Japan. So a lot of uh, Okinawans listen to American radio and enjoy American music while they drive. Uh, the bases attract tourists. This has actually been true uh, since even before Okinawa reverted to Japan. In the beginning, it was uh, Japanese tourists who wanted to learn about the war. Uh, but now it's not just Japanese tourists, it's also international tourists who want to come and uh, take pictures of American jets taking off, for example. Um, and one other thing, uh, if you do a search online, you can find guides for uh, Japanese women or men on how to meet, hook up with, and marry members of the American military in Okinawa. They say, go for Air Force people, they're the smartest. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'll ask you later if that's true. <laughs> Uh, so there is a sense that uh, the bases are kind of loved, right? People are excited about them. They bring a lot, they have a lot to offer. Um, so if they're loved, where is all this protest coming? Skipping a page. I am skipping a page. Huh. Okay. Just briefly, here's a survey that was conducted in 2018 by the East West Center of Okinawans uh, aged 20 to 40. 
Uh, it's, it wasn't a very comprehensive survey. It's not a very big sample, but it shows that uh, the most common responses for describing US troops were friendly and helpful. And that that's much more true for younger people than for older people. So we can see that there's a trend among Okinawans that they're more uh, open to or excited about or friendly with the military, the younger they get. Uh, and that is in part because they have no memories of this occupation period of the war, of the things that happened to their parents and grandparents. Um, but also because for them, the bases have always been, it's always been a part of their life. It's not something, they don't remember what it could be like without it. So they're just used to it. It's just the new normal. Um, so the third image that I find, and I heard this a lot, I heard this both in the mainland and in Okinawa, is that the protesters don't represent the Okinawan people. The people that you see in front of the base of the people who are complaining that that's not real Okinawans. Um, some said that it was what I mentioned before. It's these people who are protesting to get government money for Okinawa. Uh, I heard many times that it was people from other parts of Japan who didn't really understand the situation in Okinawa and were just coming in to protest. Uh, and so they were stepping in without really knowing what they were doing. Uh, and many, many, many people told me that the, the protesters are full of foreigners, Koreans and Chinese especially, some of them even funded by the Chinese government in order to fill out the numbers. The idea being that the stronger the protests, the more unstable the US-Japan relationship can be. Um, so these are some of the, oh, the other thing that you hear is that the protesters are college students who were put on a bus and given some money and said, go sit in front of the base with them. And then if you ask, well, who's paying them? They say, oh, well, well I don't know, but maybe Trump. So I heard this story a lot, but I joined a lot of protests. Uh, I protested, I went to the super early morning protests in front of bases that the working people go to before they go to work. I went to the huge protests that happen once a month in front of the Henoko construction. I joined peace marches across the island. I went to symposia, I joined all these different things, met as many of these activists as I could, talked to different organizations. And this is what I found. The vast majority of the protesters are old people because they don't have to work. They have time to protest. They are not getting money from the Chinese government. They're actually getting money from the Japanese government. They're living on a pension that's generous enough that they can spend their time protesting. Um, they are not manipulated by the media or unsophisticated about international affairs. Uh, these are people who were more up to date than me about developments, internal do domestic developments between or within the Chinese Communist Party, or people who knew a lot about the environmental effects of the new engine being used on a particular type of jet. These people knew everything. Uh, so they're not being tricked. They're not being manipulated. And it's not that they don't know what they're talking about. Um, I did meet people from other parts of Japan, but these are people, uh, for example, I met a woman who protests every week in front of Camp Zama, close to Tokyo. And when she has time and money, she goes to Okinawa and joins the protests there. So someone said, oh, well, how's she paying for all these trips? Well, actually, when her husband died, she sold his old farm, and she uses that money for trips to Okinawa. It's not the Chinese government. Um, everyone I talked to could tell me, like, oh, no, this is where my money comes from. This is how I pay for my activities. Um, and nearly all of the Japanese that I met from other parts of Japan had these kind of connections or convictions beyond just, I want to go to Okinawa, to Okinawa and protest. Um, I did meet foreign activists. I met an entire group of uh, pastors from South Korea uh, who were part of a major network of activists in South Korea working against the military bases there and had come to build solidarity and create connection between the movement. So there are foreigners there, but those foreigners are there for good reason. They're there because they see this as not just a local issue. Um, and again, uh, I dug as deep as I could wherever I could. Sometimes I was a little rude. And I could not find anyone who gave me the least suspicion that there were that they were getting funding from some, you know, shadow organization. Um, 
everybody was there because they wanted to be there and they were there of their on their own money. Um, almost no university students. The same survey I showed you about uh, young people liking the military more shows that most uh, Okinawans under 40 have joined a protest at most twice in their life. Any more than that is extremely rare. So uh, there are several who haven't joined any or who did it one time. So you don't see a lot of young people at these protests uh, because young people have other things to do. They're in school, they're at work, they can't spend their day in front of the military. So clearly things are more complex than, than these three images have suggested. Uh, I have been really hard pressed to find an Okinawan who was 100% pro-base or 100% anti-base. And when I say that, what I mean is, for example, I met someone who had been working for 27 years uh, with an environmental organization protesting environmental damage caused by the base. Uh, and he told me all about how uh, his grandchild is homeschooled by the wife of a Marine. Uh, others talked about how they had uh, US uh, troops or their kids babysitting their children. But they have these kind of very normal community ties with them. They don't hate the people. They don't uh, see them all as monsters or invaders. But at the same time, one, someone who I met, who I really saw as one of the staunchest supporters of the alliance in Okinawa, uh, talked to me about how afraid he always is for his town whenever there's a military crime. Because if the base goes on lockdown, then all of the bars and restaurants in his town dry up. And they have to find some way to keep going without roughly half the population of the town having access to their restaurant. Um, and then the other thing I want to mention, and that's why I chose this particular picture of these uh, protesters actually in America, is when people talk about protesting in Okinawa, much more commonly than, than protesting bases or protesting the military as a whole, they're protesting chemicals, they're protesting the construction. There's a lot more anti chemical than there is anti base. In fact, uh, this is true of the current government. He has, he has won twice now, he's been elected twice on the platform of anti-chemical construction, but has stated that he's not anti-base. He's just anti-chemical construction. So now I wanna talk about a couple of even more complex, even more interesting cases. Uh, this is Karigaoka Retirement Home in Northern Okinawa. Uh, Marines have been volunteering there from Camp Hansen for a very long time. This is a uh, Thanksgiving dinner where uh, Marines came and sat with the elderly people who lived there and ate with them and chatted with them. Uh, in 2000, when Bill Clinton was visiting Okinawa, he gave a speech where he talked about this exact case as the, the kind of the symbol of Okinawan American friendship. This is what it means to be a good neighbor in Okinawa. This is what all the bases should be doing. And because he said that, and that became big news, this became kind of the centerpiece for when anyone in the United States Marines and anyone in most of the Okinawan bases talk about the things they're trying to do to uh, support local communities. They talk about, oh, well, now we've had this relationship with this nursing home for over 20 years, and we go all the time. And in fact, they do. Uh, the nursing home, all of its gardening is done by Marines. Of course, this wasn't true during the pandemic, but outside of the pandemic, all of their gardening is done by Marines. All of their gardening equipment is purchased by Marines. And in addition to that, they have troops coming and uh, I went with them to sing Christmas carols right before Christmas. And we wore Santa hats and gave out food. Um, they have Thanksgiving events, they have other holiday events to just spend time with these elderly people, give them something to brighten up their day. Uh, and this is great. But what it has meant is that the owner of this nursing home, uh, who is not a poor man, has not had to pay for gardens for over 20 years. He has not had to pay for gardening equipment for over 20 years. Uh, at the same time, Bill Clinton talked about his business, and he has ridden that way. There are pictures of him shaking hands with Abe Shinzo, former prime minister, who recently died, right? 
Uh, he is now a local elite. He's reached public office in his area several times, and he's invited to the base for ceremonies when they change commanders. Uh, so having been called out by Bill Clinton as this great example, he has really turned this into something that improves his status. And he does that in a way that doesn't really help the military. I'm sure the military can still point to this and say, oh, we have this really long-standing relationship. But he's found a way outside of pro-base or anti-base to just say the base is here and I can use it. Uh, the other example I want to talk about uh, comes from a high fashion brand based out of Okinawa called Lekia, which is the old, I want to say Portuguese way to write UQ, one of the very, very old ways to talk about Okinawa. Uh, it is a high fashion brand based in Okinawa. They have shops in Asia and in Europe. Uh, and they have one label within their brand called Made in Occupied Japan. Uh, they use repurposed military surplus. They started with tents from the army from the 1970s that were supposed to go to Vietnam and were never sent. And they cut them up and used them to make fancy bags. Uh, and from there, they got into using other materials to make uh, other kinds of clothing and accessories, all out of these kind of former military materials that were just lying around in the backs of warehouses across the Um Now, the, the creator of this, his name is Takazu Yoshinari. Uh, he told me that he sees his brand as being this representation of Okinawan identity. And in that sense, it's not only the military stuff, they also use uh, traditional Okinawan indigo dyes uh, for another one of their labels. So he's trying to bring in these elements of Okinawan culture into high fashion. Um, but I asked him, well, why did you call it made in occupied Japan, right? Uh, Japan isn't occupied, this, these were made in Okinawa. What does this mean to you? Uh, and what he told me was that uh, he didn't think about it a whole, that it was a, partly it was a, a way to kind of give his brand flavor or clout. But the more he thought about it, the more he realized it was actually a critique of the Japanese government, that he felt that in many ways, because the Japanese government doesn't respect Okinawan uh, rights or Okinawan votes, that uh, they are occupied by Japan, and that the US presence there is just a sign of this Japanese occupation. So he's used the basis to create a high fashion brand, and also to make this critique of the Japanese government. But he himself doesn't identify as pro-base or anti-base. He said he really respects the protesters and that he grew up with the bases and they're just, they're just a part of normal life. So this is another case of someone who uh, isn't part of this whole, uh, do they love the bases, do they hate the bases, but is still man managing to incorporate the bases into their life in these new ways that have nothing to do with what the military wants or what the military wants. So to wrap up, oh, I hate it when they put a whole paragraph on the page. This is mostly so I can read it out loud. Uh, calling Okinawans pro-base or anti-base ignores the complex realities of living with the bases. Okinawans grow up in a place where a child can be excited to meet Santa at a Marine-based Christmas festival while simultaneously worried that Marine aircraft parts could fall on them at their school playground. Under these circumstances, people find strategies to adapt not just living with the bases, but even leveraging those bases to improve their own lives and careers. This is not to suggest that hosting the US military is good for them, but rather that categories like pro-base and anti-base serve only to undermine or pigeonhole Okinawan attitudes toward the bases, making issues like the Henneco construction easier to ignore. The last thing I wanna say is, this is very often considered an Okinawa issue, right? The bases, that's an Okinawa problem. But the bases are there because that's where the Japanese government wants them, for Japan's national defense. It is a national issue. And the bases are there because that's where America wants them, for part of its international network of military defense. So it's there because America wants them. So it's not just a, a national issue, it's also an international issue. And looking at people protesting this one base and thinking like, oh, that's, a, that's an Okinawan thing misses this whole bigger picture about how what they are dealing with is part of a much larger structure of 
a Kinawan or a Japanese policy of US policy that is not necessarily working with them or listening to what they have to say. Okay, thank you very much. So um, we're going to open everything up for, for Q&A right now. And the, the way we'll do this is um, if our folks here in Ryogoku have a question, I'm going to ask you to use this microphone because the people at home can't hear you. But before we do that, we had a request on Zoom for somebody who has a question. And I'll, uh, I'll let you go first. Alex, do you want to turn on your microphone and ask your question? Sure. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, nice to meet you, uh, Carl. My name is Alex. I'm a student uh, of uh, Lakeland. My question is, uh, we know there are countries uh, around Japan like Russia, China, North Korea, and South Korea. Uh, what might the surrounding countries do to Japan after United States return the bases? Do you think uh, some of them attack Japan? If yes, why? If no, uh, why again? Thank you. This is a, a very big question. Thank you for that. Uh, this is something that I always have to ask the peace activists when they say they want the full military effort. Well, how do you see Japan moving forward? Uh, and their answer is often something like they want Japan to be uh, a state based on uh, humanitarian aid, but they want to be friendly and loved so that no one has a reason to attack. Um, and it's up to you whether or not you feel that is a realistic model for international relations. Uh, but my own personal opinion is that I don't see that as happening anytime soon. Uh, there are plans to eventually move many of the bases out of southern Okinawa, uh, but never to give up Okinawa completely. The U.S. sees it as a very strategic place, and no one in the rest of Japan wants bases where they are. Uh, now, the reason for them being in Okinawa is mostly because that's mostly because that's where they was they were built to begin with. There isn't any more a major strategic difference between having them in Okinawa and somewhere else because. For the U.S. Marines to leave Okinawa, they have to get on a ship that leaves from Sasebo. So that means that a ship from Sasebo, anywhere that it can reach in the same time it can reach Okinawa, would be just as strategic. So uh, they're not going to give it up because they have it, because it is what the U.S. military and what the Japanese government want right now, and because there is a perception of a threat, right? Uh, a few years ago, I might have said that I didn't think that any kind of threat was coming, but after what Putin has done in Ukraine, uh, I've gotten back to thinking about how uh, world leaders don't make rational decisions when they decide what they're going to do. And the international community doesn't always step up in the way that maybe you want it. So I don't think they're going to leave, is my answer to that. Um, if they did, I don't know, there would have to be some other plan. The, J the Japan Self-Defense Force is sizable and competent, but it is still uh, small and limited compared to the US military. Did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, may, may, may I ask again uh, another question? Uh, we have no, uh, now the, the uh, attacking of Russia to Ukraine, so uh, I think we don't have any support to 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 say that uh, uh, no country around Japan is going to to attack Japan because they don't like actually Japan because of the Second War, and I think the peace of Japan is because of uh, United States basis. So because of that, I think they they don't do that now. What do you think? Thank you. Yeah, I think that there, there are, are scholars who pointed out that the idea of a deterrence is flawed. That if someone's going to attack, they're going to attack. It doesn't matter if the other person is armed. It matters if 
the people telling them to attack are really pissed off. Uh, if your people are pushing you to attack, sometimes you attack even if the other side has no weapons. So we can't say that the presence here is keeping them away uh, because deterrence doesn't really work uh, in the way that we often think it does. But it does something, and they are here to respond. So I think you're right. I think it does at least mean that anyone who wanted to come to uh, to come after Japan would have a moment of pause to consider what that would mean. Yeah, I got my answers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, let me if there's a question in the back of the room. Um, so yes, I'll, I'll be soon. I don't necessarily have a question. Uh, it's just more of a, the comment uh, the comment was made earlier about like spaces in like northern Okinawa were very interesting. Uh, I myself was a Marine in Okinawa from 2017 to 2019. And I can definitely say that there definitely was a sense of uh, hostility, but from my own experience, um, I didn't really necessarily hold hostility towards like the Okinawan people. It came more so from the U.S. Marines, um, and because of the fact of stuff that had happened in the past. So when I got out there in 2017, there was a lot of stuff that we were told about that had happened in the past. And so the Marine Corps had to put a lot of restrictions on us, even though the generation of Marines that were there now were responsible for it. And one thing people kind of have to understand um, when it comes to the Marine Corps, it's a lot of angry and upset, you know, people that are in the organization. You're in a foreign land that you know you don't know, uh, you don't know the language. For a lot of them, it was their first time away from you know, their families and everything. And so some of the things that we were dealing with on an organizational level just uh, didn't kind of comply. So sometimes when it came to like the weekend, that anger and frustration really kind of came out. Um, but I, I definitely do feel like there's a sense of wanting to be unified with the Okinawan people. Um, I actually really appreciate that you came here and like gave this discussion because this is something that is kind of a big deal that isn't really talked about too much. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your comments. Um, I can say a couple of quick things about that. Uh, the, uh, this issue of uh, Marines today being punished for the actions of Marines and troops from the past is very real. And I understand why people experience it that way. But it's also uh, something that Okinawans don't experience. For them, the bases have always been there. It's not points. It's a straight line from A to Z. So it's this very different sense of time where the Okinawans are always there and the Americans are in there for one, two, three years and then out of it. Uh, and that's something that I think that the military needs to do more to kind of reconcile because uh, if you're only thinking of it as, oh, well, I didn't do this, then you're going to miss the point of why uh, these restrictions are in place. But yeah, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, I think there's another question on Zoom. Uh, Simon, do you have a question? Ah, uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes. Great. Yeah, well, thank you for the presentation. It was fascinating. And um, I was especially interested as an anthropologist about the interviews and the nuance and the complexities that you, you've learned. So, yeah, I was just wondering thinking back to how the Japanese occupied it from, I believe, the 1870s. Um, and it was, you know, before that, a, a unique Ryukyu civilization, in a sense. Um, how does that factor in to, I mean, the, obviously, there's a lot of antipathy still between the Japanese government and the Okinawan people. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of like uh, Matsui and Osaka police, you know, using derogatory epithets, uh, the dojin. Or, um, so I just wonder, you know, do is that still there? Like, do the, do people consider themselves Ryukyu, and is there even a possibility for you know, separation or independence? Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, there is a 
very, very, very small UK independent community. And it has, uh, from the, the surveys that I've seen, it has very little sympathy with the overall population of Okinawa. Uh, most Okinawans fall into a place where they believe they're Japanese, they identify as Japanese, but they would like more local autonomy, more control over what happens in Okinawa shifted to them rather than the Japanese government. Uh, and this kind of double standard from the Japanese government uh, still exists today. Uh, a very alarming example of it, in my opinion, is uh, in 2019, uh, Okinawa held a prefecture-wide referendum where over 70% of voters said they wanted to stop the Henoko construction. Uh, in response to that, the minister, the Japanese Minister of Defense said, well, Okinawa has their democracy and the nation has ours. Right? As if to say that their voices don't matter, that they're not a part of the big picture. So the Okinawa is in this place where the national government says, oh, you are part of the nation. You are responsible for giving up this land uh, in order to protect the whole nation. But when it comes to hearing your voices in a democratic way, no, you're not really part. So I think that still exists, uh, but not in a way that is pushing people towards independence, just in a way where a lot of Okinawans would like to see more, uh, more control over what happens to Okinawa resting in their own hands. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any more questions? So the flyer that I got said that you're a graduate student working on your PhD. Can you tell us what your dissertation is going to be about since you spend so much time on it? <laughs> oh, what a fun question. Uh, yes, I am a PhD candidate in East Asian Languages and Cultural Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, and my focus is on looking at, generally speaking, it's on looking at the human side of the U.S.-Japan security alliance, looking at uh, relationships between people and communities across uh, base countries. Uh, more specifically, one thing I'm really interested in is how ideas of culture and cultural education and cultural exchange are used in that, like the military uh, offering cultural training or, uh, you know, representing American culture through base festivals, and how the military uh, kind of controlling or contextualizing these ideas of culture affects the way people learn and interact. I can't wait to read it. I can't wait to write it. I'm going to deliver the mic over here. I don't like comments. No, we're good. Yeah. Yeah. So I've already mentioned a couple of times about the uh, cultural training that the service members get uh, when they arrive in Okinawa. And I don't know about the other uh, service members here, but myself and my other wingmen in Okinawa, I don't remember getting any kind of training. And so they more preach about um, international relations. There's, like, you don't really get taught anything, but they say, do not be out drunk past 12. Do not drive your cars here. Do not go here. Do not do this. And if you do, then everyone's going to get locked down. And they mostly preach about staying out of trouble rather than teaching you the proper way to do things. Tell you what not to do and not what you should do. Because that was the kind of thing. Can I ask what base you were serving on? Yeah, I was at Kadena for about four years. Uh, I did meet with the instructors who teach this course on Kadena. But uh, what I saw in many of my observations was vastly different from base to base. There were bases where it was a 45 minute lecture and bases where it was a 40 hour course. Uh, but in the places where it took place as part of a larger series of lectures, like you had your, your health insurance lecture and your chaplain's office lecture and wedged in between would be this kind of Japanese culture lecture. And most of the people taking it got there yesterday and they're super jet lagged and they've already sat through 11 PowerPoints. And so how much it's actually being absorbed is very questionable. Now that you mention it, I'm pretty sure that's the same lecture where they give you your driver's license and they teach you like, oh, these are the traffic signals. So it's like four, five, four. Now that you mention it, that might've been there, but yeah, it, it should be more emphasized in a, a lecture of its own that's mandatory. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, here we go. 
Hey, um, my name is Louis Clark. Um, great presentation. Uh, this one, I spent eight years in the USA. Uh, this was similar to Jonah. Um, I think it's based on each command and unit. Uh, I know when I went through North Carolina, it was more of a week long thing, uh, cultural uh, classes and other things, just like what I'm saying. Uh, but I think this is based on units and battalions that, that I went through. Uh, my question was, and I did I did a small research last semester um, in my U.S. paramedics class. Was the whole thing about the Article Nine? I did. I asked twenty random uh, Japanese citizens, uh, ages between nineteen and about eighty, here here in, here in Tokyo, about them rewriting the Article Nine, and a lot of them were against it. Um, one, they were against it, and two, it would cost them money to to build up the military and replace the U.S. military, it was just cheap, cheap, uh, cheap or cheaper to keep the military. Is, is there any truth or am I missing something on it? Oh, that's absolutely true. In fact, it's true both for Japan and for the U.S. Uh, the Japanese government pays the rent on land occupied by the U.S. So it's cheaper for us to keep our troops here than to move them back to the land. Whereas for the Japanese, uh, the problem is that because not the problem. The 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 fact that the situation is that because uh, Japan has never really developed a strong defense sector because they couldn't profit from it, they could profit more from heavy industry, from cars, from electronics. Uh, they would have to buy everything. They couldn't make things here. Uh, and if they started making things here, it would be a long time before they could be even vaguely competitive. So the industrial backing you need isn't there. There's a huge problem with recruiting, getting enough members for the self-defense force even now without it expanding. And because of demographic change, there are gonna be fewer and fewer young people. So they wouldn't have anyone to fill the seats. Uh, so there's that, and there are other kinds of structural issues aside from Article 9 that just would make it basically impossible at this point. Um, but, also, there's a lot of pride with Article 9. Article 9 is this beautiful, unique thing where they consider our country as a peace constitution. A lot of people really believe in that, really support that, and really want Japan to have this future that is based on peace. So uh, I think it would be, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's not, the love for Article 9 is perhaps not as strong as it once was, but it's still uh, a very strong underlying current in Japanese education. It's still something that I think most people are pretty attached. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hey, Luis, guess who used to teach US Japan relations at Lakeland University? This guy. <laughs> I told you he was an expert. Time for one last question. Insert myself back in here and then hit. Let's give a big round of applause to Carl. Um, so th thanks again, everybody, for joining us uh, at home and also here. Um, we don't have a lecture in December because the school is out of session. However, we're going to stick with the island theme in January. Um, bust out your Aloha shirts because we're going to be joined by an expert on Hawaiian culture who's also uh, a musician, and there's a rumor that she's bringing her ukulele. So um, it will have flyers and everything and announcements ready to go for that, um, you know, before the next semester starts. Um, for those of you who are at home, if you'd like to be put on our mailing list, then you can just send an email to the, the same address where the, uh, the announcement tonight came from. Everybody, thank you. Have a great night, and take care.